Hi everyone, I'm Camila and I work at the Virology Lab in the Institute of Tropical Medicine, University of Sao Paulo. And today we are going to talk about the genetic and evolution of arboviruses. This lecture will be divided into three main points. First, we are going to talk about some basic concepts of RNA virus evolution, arboviruses in particular, then we go through the importance to study genetic information to understand the relationship among the pathogens and how to do it using either local or web tools. And finally, I think it's important to, to discuss uh, and show you some examples of analysis and the importance of it for the diagnostic field. Before we go through sequence analysis and phylogenies, uh, we need to know some particularities of the organisms we are working with. First, the basic point, the most important concept is that the viruses evolve fast. Among the reasons, we can mention the generation time. To have an idea, RNA virus replicate very fast and some of them can produce up to 10,000 particles from a single infection in 10 hours period. The interval between transmissions event is also important. For dengue, for instance, uh, the estimated number of days needed to have a case-to-case -case event. I mean, one infected person is bited by a mosquito and the mosquito gets infectious and bites another susceptible person is estimated to be around two to three weeks. And it can vary according to temperature or environmental conditions since the replication rate in mosquito depends uh, on the external temperature mostly. And finally, the intrinsic rate of mutation, which depends on the viral factor as the RNA replicates that speeds up the evolution of all RNA viruses. This graph shows the mutation rate for different organisms as just for comparison, you can see that RNA virus mutate faster than any DNA virus, either single or double strand, which also mutate faster than no viral organisms. This is mainly because the type of enzyme, enzyme they use to replicate. The RNA replicase is very error prone. To have an idea, if uh, RNA virus, like most arboviruses, with a genome about 10 to 12,000 basic pairs, uh, if this virus have a RNA replicase with a 10 to minus 4 error rate, it will be produced one mu sorry one mutant genome per cycle of replication. And at the end of one single day, we may have a population of extremely genetically diverse virus in our body. So why do we see a contrast between rapid intra-host evolution versus relative long-term conservation when sequences are compared? This is a print of a dengue virus assemble of reads generated by next gene sequencing. And despite many point mutations, as you can see here and here, T's to A's, A to G's, we have a consensus that represents the most frequent nucleotide in every single position. So no matter how many single point mutations we have, at intra-host population, if they, do not, if they do not represent the majority of nucleotides in that given position, the consensus won't be altered. At the end, what drives the intra-host mutation is basically the mutation rate of the RNA polymerase. This is another, maybe a little bit more complex uh, example of what I just said, but it's simple. At the end, it's simple. This figure represents what happens with a virus 
here is a West Nile virus at the intra-host level and inter-host comparison. This side of this figure, the right side in purple color, are the consensus of five distinct isolates of West Nile, named C, D, E, F, and G. Uh, imagine that they have identical consensus sequence. But these viruses were deep sequenced, and looking at the deep sequence results of each one, we can see different nucleotide changes occurring in each one that were not fixed at the final consensus genomes. They are identical. I mean, we have different haplotypes for five identical consensus sequence. And this, it does not necessarily impact on what is observed at inter-host level. Still speaking about genetic diversity versus conservation, we have to remember that for arbovirus, you also have in addition the constraint imposed by the alternance of hosts. The virus have to replicate well in both mosquito and vertebrate host. As a consequence, every change, every substitution has a potential to increase the fitness in one host, but maybe to decrease the fitness in the other host. So it's more likely the stability of the genome is preserved through the time. And the combination of mutation rates and all the selection pressures reflects in what we see in, a, in the phylogenetic tree. As you may know, as longer as the branch is, more distance are the sequence. I mean, more substitutions were accumulated. For this reason, the longest branches are those that define the most divergent sequence. Here, the four distinct serotypes that split 7,000 years ago, the longest branches in the tree represented in the red color, and the more external or shorter branches cluster together the sequence that separated more recently. For instance, the, genoty the genotypes that split from each other for 100 or 200 years ago, depending on the serotype. And lastly, the lineages existing within genotypes that emerge in new lineages every year. That said, we can go to the next topic of this lecture, where we can see what kind of information we can obtain from a good phylogeny. It actually serves for any virus, but we will illustrate it with alpha and falavivirus examples. And I think it's important to stress that you don't have to be an expert in phylogenetics to do simple analysis by yourself. Most of us are used to use BLAST2 to classify a virus, right? And you could ask me if genotyping can also be done using BLAST. Yes, sometimes, if there is sufficient divergence among the genotypes and sufficient reference sequence in the database from that virus, you will not find any problem. But sometimes the researcher that put that genome sequence in the database just don't know how to classify it at lower levels. So he just named the organism with the family or gender information. For dengue, for example, it's very common when you do a blast, you find it as an answer like dengue serotype two or dengue serotype one. But how often you actually find dengue serotype two Asian genotype or American genotype? Almost never, right? On the other hand, a tree can give you this answer if you use sufficient reference sequence and diverse reference sequence. But you don't necessarily have to do it in your own computer. There are online tools that help us with basic stuff. A uh, first good example is Genome Detective Tool. This tool is designed to analyze viruses, not only arbovirus, but any non-virus in the earth. 
You can use as input the reads you obtain it from next generation sequence, like a FASTAQ file, for instance, very big files, or a consensus sequence in FASTA format that you already had assembled. You can use this tool to type or classify any known virus, as I said, but you can classify in more detail all these viruses in this list. There, there is a little bit more detailed information regarding these viruses in their database. And here, uh, just an example of dengue typing using genome detection. As an input, I submitted one FASTA file containing two sequences, so a polyfasta. And you can upload your sequences, how, how many sequences you want in FASTA format at once. And here we have the result output page. As I said, I have submitted one FASTA file containing one complete genome and one partial genome from two distinct serotypes. And you can see here that it correctly identified both, determined the length of the sequence I submitted and their position at the reference genome. And at the end, you can also download the results as an Excel format or in FASTA format together to the references. The virus pathogen resources is another place that you can do lots of analysis. It can be op optimized for a given virus family, for instance, following the same principle that the genome detective, I think, detailed information availability within the database. Or more specifically, you can choose to analyze sequence from a known virus like dengue, Zika, or yellow fever. You can also count on websites with more comprehensive contents that offers you lots of possibilities to run the analysis in more independent way. This is an example, the phylogeny.fr. I really like this, this website. I think it offers several options that starts with alignment tools to more sophisticated phylogenetic reconstruction programs as FineML and RexML. And at the end, to manage your tree, it also offers tools for tree visualizations. The first thing you need to do a phylogenetic analysis is to choose good references and have a good alignment. But if you are unsure about what alignment tool you have to use, here are some suggestions that I like. MAFT, for instance, is currently one of the best alignment tools. You can have it in your own computer. It is a command line program, but very simple and very easy to use and to install. But for those who has no ability at all in Linux commands, you can use the online tool without any problem. Uh, it was recently updated for SARS-CoV-2 alignment. And that's because SARS-CoV virus have a three times larger genome than the arbovirus on average. So when you are aligning a hundred or 200 or even a thousand of genomes, it can be very time consuming. So now, you will have no problem at all to use it, no matter how many genomes you want to align. Once you have your sequence already aligned, you will need a program to do your phylogenetic re reconstructions, right? You can also find it online using maximum likelihood methods or distance methods or parsimony or any method you want. In case you want a maximum likelihood method, uh, I recommend using finding mail or rexing mail, which are the most used for arbovirus analysis. Here, an example of Montpellier website that offers you the finding mail program that run in their server. And finally, uh, I want to show you just two, the next string. Uh, 
is to do not allow you to input your sequence and analyze it to get the database. I mean, actually it does, but you have to install it in your own computer and require some advanced acknowledgement of command line programs to do it. Anyways, here you can explore several analyses already done with some emerging virus. Dengue, Zika, West Nile, Chikungunya are included. And when you visualize the tree, you can also choose to color the virus, the taxa, by country, by lineage, and even ask to color by sampling date. The analysis of timing and origin of clades were already done, so you can just adjust for your question and get the information you need. Besides the typing, we can also obtain information regarding the origin and time of split of the lineages or genotypes. All you need is to get the sampling time of sequence and a good alignment. We can estimate it because there is a direct relationship between time and genetic divergence between a pair of sequence. I mean, if we know the evolutionary rate of a given virus, or if you don't know, but you have information about when they were sampled, you can estimate how long they are evolving from a common ancestor just by looking at how much divergence they accumulated in such period of sampling. Still using dengue as an example, uh, we were capable of estimating when the distinct serotypes first entered in human population. This tree was reconstructed using the alignment data and was calibrated using the dates of sampling information. So at the end, we have that dengue, dengue serotype 2 was probably the first to enter in the human population, followed by dengue 1, dengue 3, and then dengue 4. Also, by knowing the sampling date and geographical location of the samples, we can do phylogeographic studies. This in particular was done for Zika virus. Here using region, geographical region, and sampling date information, as well having sufficient reference sequences, it was estimated that the virus most likely came from Pacific Island, belonged to the Asian lineage, and entered in Americas, more specifically in the Northeast region of Brazil, in 2013 to 2014, which means about one year before being detected for the first time. The virus further spread to the state of Central West and South regions, and then to the other countries too. More recent analysis, also using sequence data found not only, sequence data, sorry, uh, they found not only a replacement of the main lineage that circulated in previous years, but also the introduction of the African lineage in Brazil in 2020. Of course, to do this type of analysis, it's needed constant sampling and sequencing effort. It has been doing very efficiently with SARS-CoV-2 in some countries, as you know, and the ideal scenario would be that we also have this capacity for all virus. Real-time surveillance is actually one of the best examples of the importance of massive sequence and analyzing data. And finally, I'm going to talk about the importance of knowing sequencing for the diagnostic field. This graph, shows how much dengue is similar among the serotypes. The black line represents the amino acid identity and the red line represents the same data, but for nucleotides. You can see that the conservation level can reach up to 90% in some regions at nucleotide level and then and 92% at the amino acid level, in particular in the NS5 region, that is the virus replicase, which is also the most conserved gene uh, in all the dengue gene. 
At one hand, such a level of conservation allows us to easily design genetic tests as for simultaneous detection of all dengue serotype or even for distinct virus from the same genome. You probably know some of these protocols that can detect the four serotypes of dengue or simultaneously dengue, yellow fever, Japanese encephalitis, Zika, West Nile, and etc. But all this conservation has a cost. On the other hand, it's very easy to happen cross-reaction when you don't want the, the tests cross-react. Here is an example uh, that what actually we observed during the 2015 Zika epidemic here in Brazil. We had the circulation in the time of both Zika and Dengue at the same time. And as you know, they are both very similar to each other flavivirus. In our lab, we've been using for a long time this PCR described in 2010 that is capable to detect the one to four at once, giving it similarity in the five UTR, five UTR region. And that time we started to note that in Zika positive samples with particularly high viral loads, we also could observe some positivity in dengue PCR. Okay, co-infection is not impossible, but we wondered if it was the case, because as more Zika positive samples we had, more putative co-infection we had to. So what I did was to align the region of the primers used for dengue and the correspondent region from Zika virus. We found some mismatches in both primers, but they were not located at the three primary region of the primers, which means that the amplification could still happen. Although, of course, less efficiently than for dengue virus, where no mismatch exists between the primer and the genome, but still. And when we look at the probe region, the surprise, it was 100% conserved among the virus allowing perfect annealing to either dengue or Zika. This explains why in high viral loads of Zika, we could detect uh, the cross-reaction using specific, in theory, dengue primers and probe. The solution, well, if you only have this test available and no time to order for another one. You can establish, try to establish new cutoff values. You can try using more positive controls with different viral loads, but the best way is to design a new test. At the protein level, it's also complicated. Actually, I think it's more complicated than the molecular tests because at the nucleotide level, we can actually see where the problem is very easily and just design a new assay. But in serological tests, it's more complicated. Several authors have observed such cross-reaction between dengue and Zika and at lower levels among other flavivirus too. Flavivirus is subdivided into zero complex, right? Assays using polyclonal serum found that the extension of cross-neutralization uh, correlated with the level of amino acid conservation in the envelope region. So we can say that we can expect a cross-reaction if the amino acid similarity is higher than 50% in the envelope gene. So as you can see, it's a problem for Zika and Dengue that are more than 55% similar, but apparently it's not a problem when we want to analyze yellow fever and in regions that you have, for instance, Dengue or Zika circulating at the same time. It's not supposed to cross reaction. And why the cross reaction is more common in ELISA assays? 
because of the part of the envelope protein that is exposed during the assay. The fusion loop at the, the domain two in the envelope gene is the most conserved domain among all flaviviruses. And in ELISA test, it's very exposed, but it does not happen in neutralization tests. In neutralization, the fusion loop is not more exposed than any other internal domain. So the probability of cross-reaction, although it still exists, is much lower than the probability of cross-reaction in ELISA tests. So I think it, that was the message and I have three take home final messages for you. Arbovirus evolution, they mutate fast, but at the end, their evolution is a result of the high mutation rate plus the constraint imposed by alternance between the hosts. Regarding the genetic and phylogenetic characteristics, a lot of questions can be answered using viral sequence. All you have to do is to get good quality sequence and use all possible available information regarding the sequence you have. And for the diagnostic field, knowing sequences is critical to design good tests and to understand test troubles because they exist. Be aware about the cross-reaction, which is a common feature for all flaviviruses. Thank you.